If 80% of what you do is a failure, that, that doesn't work, you know? And it's, if you look at the government subsidies, it's to export crops, right? It's soy and corn and cotton and wheat and sugar and tobacco. These are export crops. And that really started back under the Nixon administration when we, the price of oil went up, you had the oil embargo, and they were like, oh, how can we increase our export earnings? Agriculture. So they did all these programs to encourage farmers, plant fence row to fence row. Don't worry about conservation. Just goose the soil with chemicals. And what we're doing is we're exporting soil and we're exporting water. Think of how much water California exports in the form of vegetables. 50% of the winter vegetables of this nation come out of our state. And that's a lot of water leaving the state. Not just the water in those vegetables, but all the stuff it took to grow it. And beef, don't even get me started on beef. It's a horrible, horrible equation for water, right? So the Ogallala Aquifer, which is the underground millennial water that took thousands of years, it goes from the Dakotas all the way down to Oklahoma, it's being tapped out. And you can see maps online of the depletion of those aquifers. What's the social impact? Corporate farm has money. They can keep paying the well digger to keep chasing that oil down. The family farm, without a lot of money, pretty soon they're out of water and they go out of business and they get bought up by that corporate farm. So it's moving in a direction of unsustainability and that's why you have this organic movement. Who, who, the educated people who are in Whole Foods wanting organic and fair trade certified, I want that market segment, college educated people. If you did a demographic of Burning Man, I went in August, right, great event. If you did a demographic and got from everybody what their educational background is, Burning Man would be the most highly educated city in the United States, probably in the world, right? It's all people with advanced degrees, or at least bachelor's degrees, professionals right, who like to drop acid or whatever, you know, run around naked and drop acid and run around naked. Who knows, you know. So there's a, I mean, think, could the right wing do a Burning Man? No, it's called NASCAR and they have fights and drunks and shooting each other, right, you know. So if, if we had global voting on these basic issues, we would win. This is what the left doesn't understand. The left has already come to power globally in terms of people's beliefs. They want, most people will vote for saving the environment and having their kids drink clean water, etc. that is negated by empire and corporate power, right? So we've already won in terms of political beliefs and ideology but we don't have the guns and the money, we don't have the seats in Congress, we don't have the right rules of the game, etc. And that's why it feels so conflicted now when we get this sense of, ah, crazy transition. But it's like childbirth, you know, there's some yelling and screaming, but new, new stuff comes into existence. And that's where we're at. Yes, sir, over here. I did miss the beginning, so. Shame on you. I, I'm curious how you see the role of collapsing systems in the evolutionary drives of an alternative because like it or not, climate and other systems are moving towards tipping points. So we may be facing global crisis and catastrophe like has never existed in human history. Right. What you got to remember is it's an iterative process. It's dialectic. As stuff starts to break down and the evidence of the breakdown becomes available to those of us who read, right, internet, books, whatever, we start to adapt accordingly. I mean, it's the way evolutionary science works, right? So those things which we see as negative and that we would categorize as collapse have a positive side. The positive side is that it's the wake up call of like, oh, the alarm went off, I need to get up and go to work. There are things that hurt initially and it tells you, oh, I have anaphylaxis, that bee stung me and I'm choking now, you know. So we react with different methodologies to try and fix that, avert future, whatever. If you look at herd animals, lemmings, bison, whatever, when, when the herd is going off a cliff, they don't all go off the cliff. There's a certain percentage of them that see what's going on, they put the brakes on and they go in a different direction. 
and that's what you're seeing in the world. The, and think, all the natural resources are running out. There's all these books that Doc, a buddy of mine, Mike Clare, did a great book on, it's called something like, What's Left? You know, the fight for what's left. And Richard Heinberg is, you know, a specialist in this. Ah, shit's all running out, right? Peak oil, peak water. Well, that information is available to literate people. And then we start realizing, oh, wait, uh, two days ago, I was at a water technology conference in San Francisco. And there's all these companies coming out with all this water purification and desalination and conservation and better shower heads and better toilets and all this kind of stuff. With California's drought, that kind of technology is gonna accelerate, right? I think we should have a website that would be educating people about the water crisis in the world because there are all these grassroots water groups that are fighting Coca-Cola in India or Nestle is trying to take the water under Mount Shasta. We've been involved in that at Global Exchange. So we should have a, a water conservation site that would be called showertogether.com. And it would be videos of people showering together. It's not, it's not pornography, it's just good, clean fun. It would, the media, you'd get lots of free media, right? And then you have all the information and you have ads from the water technology companies. So there'd be revenue and people could make donations to the grassroots groups. I have the, I have the URL, showertogether.com, if anybody wants to take off and do that because we really need to wake people up. We're, we're at that stage where we need to engage people and say, hey, look, this stuff's not gonna fix itself and the leaders in limousines aren't gonna fix it. It's up to us, the citizens, to fix this stuff. And that's going on, yes, sir? Uh, I don't know too much about this, which is why I'm asking. Uh, wind power has a lot of critics because of the big blades, kill board, uh, birds, and they're unsightly and all that. However, why not have wind power in cylinders that are open? Every house could have several cylinders. It could be spinning 24 hours a day whenever there's a breeze. Do you know anything about this? Yeah, there's several things about this. The, the first thing is big energy, whether it's solar, massive collectors, wind, the big thing, that means either big government or big corporations. Small, distributed renewables. And the reason why I know distributed renewables is the way to go is not just because the technology is awesome and it's affordable, it's that I get um, the energy business magazines and the utilities like pg e are freaking out about distributed renewables. They don't want that because that means customers will go away from them. Wind energy does kill birds because actually a lot of birds like to nest up on top of them. House cats kill more birds than wind energy. Windows kill more birds than wind energy. Buildings kill more birds than wind energy. Are we gonna get rid of house cats or windows or birds? No. So that critique sometimes is brought up in a disingenuous way by people from the fossil fuel industry that are trying to roll stumbling blocks. Wind energy is the fastest growing energy in the United States. Wind energy just passed hydro in the United States for the percentage it contributes. And what you're seeing is the kind of technology you're talking about. There's a waffle kind. There's a, um, there's a Swedish technology that's a round ball with diagonal pieces cut out of it. So it appears as a solid object to birds and it's relatively small. If you look at any downtown building, those big buildings in San Francisco, there's always a flag up at the top. And that flag is always, especially late in the afternoon, the evening, that thing is stiff in the wind. You talk to the building managers and they will tell you that they need to replace those flags every few months because the wind just rips the shit out of them. Okay, so let's put wind, small wind energy, these new technologies, and the energy is going right into that building. Duh. And you're, you, the building owner, you get to promote it. I've been to a lot of these meetings where it's all old white guys like me in suits. And they're all talking about green building this and green building that. I'm like, what the hell is this? They know they're gonna make better profits by having a green building where the workers are healthy, where they're energy efficient, the carpeting is not off-gassing deadly chemicals. You know, one of our ideas for the Green Guardians is to produce NASA did a bunch of research on plants that detoxify the air. There's a bunch of plants that will pull formaldehyde and other things out of the office air. So youth in a high school could grow those plants 
and then sell them to Facebook and Google and these other companies, right? And I apologize for my phone going off. It's probably somebody saying, sorry, I didn't make it to your talk. Anyway, other questions? Yes. Uh, would you uh, comment on would you, would you comment on your experience uh, with the United Nations with regard to uh, corporations, multinational corporations, and with uh, banking, international banking and investment? Yeah. Well, this is you know this is the single bottom line. What they're about is increasing their quarterly profit statement. What's interesting is just the last issue of Business Week has stuff about how the banks are getting hurt by the fossil fuel industry going down. The, the coal industry, a lot of these banks invested big time in coal, coal companies, and they're losing like hundreds of millions of dollars, so it's great, I love it. And that's partly economic, right, because now renewables are out competing. There's a lot of places, Arizona, New Mexico, other places, where it's cheaper to just straight financial profitability, not anything environmental or social. It's cheaper, more profitable to do wind or solar than to do coal. So coal, and plus you got all the activism. Sierra Club, Mark Brune, friend of mine, awesome. They're, they've got a big coal campaign. There are all these groups that are fighting coal. 350.org is fighting coal. So the coal industry is really on its ass. And of course Obama has done a bunch of stuff to try and implement more strict air pollution controls, because coal, coal-fired power plants, if you could change one thing in the world, coal-fired power plants are one of the big things. It's probably the biggest thing you would eliminate. China's building a whole bunch of coal-fired plants. They're doing a lot of wind and solar, too, but they're doing a lot of coal-fired plants. South Africa has a lot of coal. Russia has a lot of coal. How do you convince Venezuela to leave their heavy oil that's like the tar sands up in Alberta? Oh, leave it in the ground. Don't monetize it. Huh? You know, they're going to say to us, well, did you leave your stuff in the ground? No, you've been exploiting it. So this, this is one of the issues with national governments, trying to get national governments to subordinate themselves to global directives and global politics is they're elected by their people, and they're worried about Am I going to get reelected? Will I stay in power? If I don't monetize this resource by pulling it out of the earth, it could hurt my career. How do we get those people to think outside their own individual interests? Right? So this is, this is going to be an uphill struggle for Does sure. Does Global Exchange work with the United Nations at all? We are actually uh, registered with the United Nations. We, this is how we got into the WTO opening ceremony and jumped up on the stage and took over the microphones. And it was funny because when we went in through the security, I had a big roll of about 5,000 stickers that had WTO with the international cross out symbol and it said end corporate rule in the borders. And I was putting them on the handrails of the escalators and on the phone booths and in the men's room. I didn't go in the ladies' room on all the booths and everything like that just to say to them, we're in your house and you don't even know who we are. When I went through the security, I had these in a pocket of a raincoat that probably had a little bit of tear gas smell on it, but you know, they didn't check that. And I had to lay this roll of stickers out on the table, and the security guy just passed it right through. Didn't even look at it, didn't read it. You know. So these guys, plus people don't realize, when the WTO protest happened, and we had 50,000 people out in the street, there were about 200 so-called anarchists who broke windows and you know stupid juvenile bungee jumping kind of stuff. The media focused on that. So the impression people got was, oh, these people are violent, they're breaking windows. That was a tiny minority. And I, I and other people who helped organize the whole thing, we were standing in front of windows saying, no, no, don't break the windows. They have insurance for that. Somebody could get hurt. This is stupid. The media is going to fuck. You know, these were kids basically following some nut job in Eugene, Oregon, who told them, yeah, we should break windows. So at that time, when we had 50,000 people in the streets, some activists in Geneva went in the middle of the night on a boat to the WTO headquarters and snuck in and cut the cables of their computer system so they didn't even have their connection to their brain. And in four days of conference at the end, they didn't even have a press release 
the whole thing collapsed. And we did that through nonviolent direct organizing. I went around to all the campuses, and my opening line was, uh, how many of you students were at Woodstock in 1969? Oh, I'm the only one. Oh, that's really too bad. But there's something even better that you can go to in Seattle in November. And I had students come up to me at the event, right? Rain soaked, tear gas in the air, and go, dude, you came to my campus. You told me to come. Thanks. This is great. And they get fired up, and they see the power of nonviolent mass action. That's what Jesus got killed for. He was a mass mobilizing, nonviolent, anti imperialist revolutionary. And a lot of these Christian types forget to talk about his one act of violence. It was bankers. It was bankers. So we're less violent than Jesus. We don't want to destroy the bankers. We just want to change the World Bank headquarters into a daycare center. <laughs> or a national daycare center promotion organization. Yes, sir. So as World Federalists, this concern of like, centralizing power is, got, is an issue for some of us. Can you speak at all to the centralization of power and how that can be either not triggered or well, I think it's very much like energy. Think of the combination between renewable energy and the internet. The technology now can be spread. There's a kid in South Africa who invented, he may be from Kenya, he invented a wind energy, right? There's a 14-year-old kid who invented a water conservation technology that is now patented and being produced by a company. He was 14 when he invented this. These kids have access to information. I have to go to a library to find stuff out. All they gotta do is type in the question, and here's 27 answers to it, right? So there's been an acceleration of all this innovation. So think about the corollary in government to the renewable energy. The combination of the decentralizable decision-making, people could be voting on these issues on their handheld devices. And that's where it's all going. It's going to the handheld devices and apps on the handheld devices because you can vote on things, right? And so you can have the combination of certain things that make sense to be centralized, like climate change, planetary, but decentralized, you want local control. In Cuba, they went through a process of shutting down their state farms and going toward cooperatives and individually owned farms. Because what they realized in the state farm experience was it's like corporate ownership. People don't feel ownership of something where you're just working on a big state farm and collecting a salary. In the nonprofit world, we have this issue. The founders feel ownership, but how do staff that come in later, how do you give them a sense of ownership of the organization. Yeah, but I, I just want to respond. I'm glad whoever asked that asked that, because I, I wanted to actually thank that woman, um, but she left before I had a chance to thank her. There, there's a common misconception, I'm glad whoever brought this up, uh, raised the issue again, that what we're talking about is essentially the antithesis of central power. That what we're talking about in, in what's sometimes called the global democracy movement or the world federalist movement or whatever, is what we stand for is local issues get handled locally, state issues get handled on the state level, national issues get handled nationally, and only global issues that have to do with like countries going to war get handled at the global level. We're not, see, there's a fundamental distinction between what could be called a unitary world government, where from Brussels or whatever they run everything, versus a global federal system, which is what we're advocating for which things get handled at the appropriate level. The only problem is worldwide, we, we have systems at the city level, the state level, the national level. On the global level, there's anarchy. So in, in that space of anarchy, all the multinationals move in, the networks of power move in, that all the unelected, unaccountable people move in and take over and cause the devastation that Kevin's been talking about for the past hour. So what we want to do is have a system there so when you go to vote, you not only vote for your mayor, your governor, your president, but you also vote for your representatives to the global parliament. So that if the world has a referendum and the world votes for keeping 350 parts per million of carbon in the air, 
then the global government with the global EPA enforces it. We voted for it. Rather than these unelected, unaccountable, whatever powers that be running the show. So we're actually looking to, to displace the, that, that centralization that's happening and push things down to the appropriate levels. So I, I want to thank her for asking the question. I feel disappointed she didn't stick around to hear the answer. But a lot of the folks who have the power want to confuse people so that everyone fights against this. But we're not looking for a tyrannical, unitary thing. We're looking for things being decided at the correct level. Thank you, and thank you for ever brought that up. Yeah. And, and people, have a, people have a negative attitude. When you bring up the word government, you know, most people don't think of government as us. Think about how the right wing did a very smart thing. There was a subtext to all of their issues, whether it was welfare reform, immigration, whatever. The subtext was government is bad. Government is bad. Now, these DT party guys that are now elected in Congress, oh, you elected people to run the government who think government is bad. Oh, yeah, so you want to get rid of it and have what? Anarchy? People who have never experienced anarchy don't realize how crazy it would be. I think we should have a subtext in all of our campaigns, whatever the issue, save the dolphins, save the redwoods, whatever. Our subtext should be government is us. It's not good or bad, it's us. If it's bad, that's our fault, and it's our responsibility to fix it. Not, oh, well, we'll just elect somebody better and they'll go in and... No, it's us. We have to do it. That's the basic principle upon which our society, our political system was founded. Yes, sir? Uh, since it's us at the local level, the state level, the federal level, what are your ideas on how do you raise the public policy IQ of the individuals? And then you have an election today and you often have it turns out to be 48 to 40 percent, and 48 might be the dummies wrote for something that goes backwards. How do you see best increasing the public policy IQ of the individuals at each of the levels? Yeah, there's a huge opportunity. If you look at, you know, I do mostly green kind of stuff. So if you look at green policies in whatever, recycling, composting, biofuels, electric cars, whatever, at the local level, in cities like San Francisco and Portland and Seattle and Austin and Chicago and Chattanooga and all, and all sorts of cities. That's where the action is. There's a thing called ECLE, the International Council of Local Environmental Initiatives. It's on, it's I-C-L-E-I, -E ECLE, and it's maybe like World Sustainability or something like that. It's a five continent organization with hundreds of city governments that are members and they're sharing best practices around green policies and around sustainability. Rockefeller Foundation just gave 100 cities a million dollars each to hire chief resilience officers. And resilience covers earthquake, hurricane, natural disaster, and it covers green economy. If you're growing food in your city or you're producing local biofuels, whatever, that's resilience. And if you're educating your citizens about where does your poop go when you flush the toilet? They don't know. I mean, think, we take clean drinking water that we spend a lot of money purifying, we mix it with what we call waste, but is really nutrient. Human urine has more nitrogen in it than cow shit, pig shit, or horse shit, right? So we should be putting that urine, not mixing it with good water and sending it away to be chemicalized or whatever. It should be going back into the soil mixed about 10 to 1 with water, but still, it's a nutrient. So this is part of the change that's going on. I don't know if you guys are into permaculture. I did the permaculture design course. I spent 13 years in college. The permaculture design course was the best course I ever took. It changes your life. And you'll be surprised by doing that permaculture design course, you'll find yourself saying, well, I kind of knew this, you know? Like when it rains, you slow the water down and spread it and get it into the ground. You don't channel it into sewers. In San Francisco, we've got this big struggle. Nature gives us free, clean water in the form of rain, millions of gallons, and we treat it as waste and channel it into the same sewers as our poop. You know, that's just idiotic, right? We should be, tra every, every building should be required by policy to have rain catchment and cisterns for use in the garden, et cetera, et cetera, right? And this is gonna accelerate in California now that we have fourth year of drought. 
So it's at the local level, but at the local level is where you get the lowest turnout in voting. When we ran Matt Gonzalez for mayor of San Francisco against Gavin Newsom, Gavin Newsom spent $4 million, we spent $400,000. We were outspent 10 to 1. Matt Gonzalez got 47% of the vote. And those of us who were old-timers were like, yeah! And the young people were like, what are you cheering? We're losing. Yeah, but we usually get 8% of the vote. There's only 3% registered green voters in San Francisco, and we got 47% for a Green Party candidate. We, uh, and Matt, Matt was going to make me commissioner of police. I was like, Matt, you're out of your mind, you know. But he, Matt actually is a super integrity guy, and he's almost got too much integrity for politics. But we came really close, right, with way less money. So we're close, we're close. And there are places like Richmond where the Chevron ticket lost, right, to a progressive ticket. So we're seeing things happen at the local level, at the national and international level, they can't even agree on, agree on basic climate change stuff. But at the local level, in San Francisco, I was in San Francisco City Government and the Department of Environment, and I ran the outreach department. I had 20 staff. And we had people going out into the neighborhoods, going to these retail stores saying, hey, you know, there's city money for you to put in uh, more efficient lighting. We can help you with better gaskets on your refrigerator so your PG&E bill will go down. We can help you with insulation on your house. I got my house insulated for half what it would have cost me because of city subsidies. So at city levels, you got all of this stuff going on. Green festivals, we have in the green festivals, local government, the mayor of New York, writes us a letter, oh, I support the green festival. At the national and international level, it's a much, it's a much tougher struggle. Yes, Byron. Kevin, you, you worked at building coalitions, like in Seattle, for example, and all kinds of other coalitions. What advice do you have to us, the world federalists, how we can build a global coalition for world democracy? How, what, how, what would you do? What would you advise us to do to get these different groups that were identified in blessed unrest and, you know, in World War II? How do you get the women's group? How do you get the... the anti-globalization, how do you get the peace movement, how do you get them to work together to do what we're trying to do, which is get a world parliament for just the beginners? How would you do the tactics? Well, I always say in order to in order to change the ecosystem, we have to change the ego system, you know? We have to learn how to check our egos at the door. We all have a personal agenda. We all have knowledge and wisdom that we want to share. But the way we share it is the key thing. And there are those voices that are very wise voices, but they're quiet, they're shy, they don't, they're not used to speaking in public, whatever. People are afraid of speaking in public. And I would say, well, what do you think could happen? You think people are gonna throw things at you? But we all have that fear, and the trick is to get the butterflies to fly in formation. So that's at that individual level of how do we get people to participate in groups where it's not about me, it's about us. I played a lot of sports coming up as a kid, and I, whenever I was on a hiring committee for Global Exchange or Green Festival or whatever, I would always ask the job candidate, what sports did you play as a youth? And if they played team sports, that was a plus, because you have to subordinate ego to the team. And our coaches weren't quite that articulate, they wouldn't use those terms. But it was about what's good, what's going to advance the team. And if that means me playing a position that I don't particularly like, I'm going to suck it up and I'm going to play that position. I don't particularly love fundraising, but I've done a lot of fundraising because that's necessary if you're going to build an organization. So what I like is platforms, platforms for conviviality. There will be changes in the people in this room because of their two hours that they spent in this room today. The Green Festival is a platform that I started as a stepping stone toward a real estate platform like this one we're trying to do in San Francisco. You go to any city and you say, where's your green everything store where I can see all the green products in one place? That doesn't exist. So there's a big gap between the green economy is growing like crazy. There's not a retail collaborative model. These small local green companies are too small to have a great downtown location on their own, but if you group them up in a big mall kind of structure and then have it set up so you can roll everything aside at night and lock it up and have events and hip hop and poetry slams and stuff like that, people come out 
and they get together. I'm trying to recruit the radio, the school district in San Francisco owns an FM station, a community supported station, KLW. It's a great radical station. They could be on a mezzanine level with glass walls facing onto that commercial space floor. So when Amy Goodman is speaking that night, they're on the radio with thousands of people. Hey, come on down to 1950 Mission. Amy Goodman's here speaking, right? That's free advertising, and all I got to do is work out the financial model so they get cheap rent on that space and get really good equipment in that space. It's all about nature's core principle is unity of diversity. Unity of diversity. You think about your fingers, these are all breakable. When they come together, they're not breakable. And that's what we gotta do. We gotta find ways. And now with the internet, if we can't unite people now, we got kids in Alaska playing chess with kids in the Netherlands. <laughs> you know, and that kind of stuff is going on. Is Sabalu in Kenya is partnered with Amesbury, Massachusetts. They're both tiny little towns. But the people in each got together and wanted to hook up with each other and they funded schools and they sent people back and forth and they learn about each other and share their cultures. That's magic. And that wasn't possible just like 10, 15 years ago. And that's why there's this acceleration of change and the excitement that comes with it. So I think we really need to fight cynicism and pessimism. That's that self-doubt. I think you need to eliminate that. Just get rid of it, purge it. Yes, ma'am. And you need to build this community online, no question. Yeah, more online connection. I want to know uh, what is happening with the Green Mart. What's happening to it today? Where, where is it at? So the question is about the Green Mart. Well, the, the city issued an RFP on this, on this property, this one here. And there are two teams. The city has all these requirements. It has to be affordable housing. It has to be a certain percentage of homeless family housing, et cetera, et cetera. The commercial piece is basically a box. They don't require much than just create a box with electric and whatever. So I'm, there's two teams of, you know, you always have architects and engineers and a nonprofit and a housing manager and, you know, there's different organizations. So there's two clusters of groups that have the inside track that are based in the neighborhood. And I'm trying to go to both of them and say, look, let me do the retail piece, right? Because I can bring in the companies, I can bring in the speakers, the events, the musicians, all that kind of stuff. I can bring in the radio station. I've been working on this particular site for 10 years now. <laughs> I could, I could, I could go on for hours about the frustration. That that lot has sat vacant for over 20 years, and it's right by my office. I see it every day, doing nothing. Right now, they're rehabbing it for some homeless services. In the meantime, the deadline for the application for the proposal is early May. They'll take a month or two to decide. One of the teams will get chosen, one of these two teams, and hopefully I'll be able to subcontract with either one that gets it and do that retail portion. And then once we do it in San Francisco, I can go to the Oakland mayor, I can go to Austin, Portland, Seattle, Chicago, whatever. Cities own lots of vacant land. And the deal is, look, you the city are gonna own this whole building. You're gonna own it. You're gonna own all the improvements, but you're gonna give us a land lease, 75 year land lease that's real cheap, a couple dollars a year. And we take that saving and pass it through to the tenants in the form of cheap rent. And that's the magic that makes the financing work. So one last question, this gentleman here, and then we gotta close up. Um, mostly thanks for your talk. I've taken a lot of notes, and I really appreciate it. You're great out there. Thanks. Um, the thing you're talking about, a demilitarized world, some kind of global piece, putting that money into education and healthcare, I think a lot of people could get behind that. I think it's a question of how and, and what kind of timeline. And the concern I have is that there are real threats in the world. You know, you, you talked about Seattle and anarchy and the risk of anarchy with the kind of quantum level technology that we have is perhaps greater than it's ever been in the past. I and mean, I'm not talking about rogue, rogue states, just small groups of individuals in a very decentralized organization. So how do we how do we deal appropriately with the level of political maturity that exists globally? And the, the, the second part of that is if we had a global democracy today, if we had 7.3 billion people in a, in a more direct democracy system voting, what do we do if the center of gravity of that consciousness is not the consciousness that you have, but is poor human rights, is non-equality for the sexes, is Sharia law, 
is something like that. Like, sure. how do we actually cope with that? Yeah, there are some bad guys in the world who believe in cutting off people's heads, you know? It's like, oh, that's a great policy. Yeah, not just even bad guys, just people that are not used to democratic sensibility. Sure. That's just not their culture. So if you give me your email, I'll send you a little plan that I've written up for converting U.S. military bases abroad into eco-universities and eco-development platforms. Think about this. The U.S. military's force structure and its strategic doctrine is all wrong. It was developed to fight a Soviet tank army on the steppes of Eastern Europe. That's not the threat. The threat now is a crazy guy with a suitcase bomb, and he wants to die. So you have no deterrent. I'll kill you. Huh, I want to die. Thanks. You know, how do you deter? It's like in a bar fight. If the guy's not afraid, you better run away because you have no deterrent, he's crazy. So we could start, as a US citizen, I take my country as my first responsibility. We could start converting US military bases. The US had a military base at Manta on the coast of Ecuador that the US left. You got a lot of buildings that are empty now. It could be a training camp for green enterprise and then people would like us. So think, you either shoot each mosquito with a five million dollar missile, we're using a five million dollar missile to blow up a fifty dollar tent in Afghanistan, in Taliban country, or you can dry up the swamp of resentment that's producing mosquitoes in the first place. When we go... Is that true though? Is that, is that, I know that's part of it, but is it unequivocally true that American foreign policy causes all those issues? Well, there's Not no way... Else. There's no way to understand the hostility of the Iranian government toward the U.S. without us understanding that we overthrew their democratically elected government in 1954. And Mossadegh, Mohammed Mossadegh was not a leftist. He was not a radical, but he wanted to nationalize the oil. Lumumba in the Congo was not a communist, but he had nationalist policies, and that's the danger. That's why they hate Cuba. The danger of Cuba is that Americans will go to Cuba and see every neighborhood has a clinic where the doctor and the nurse live in apartments above the clinic, and they know all of their patients by name, and they can recite how many pregnant women, how many blind people, how many diabetics. We could do that. Ron Dellums, actually, when he was in Congress, had a plan for that kind of thing in the United States. Didn't pass, right? So there's a contradiction between the great ideals that this country was founded on and empire. Empire and democracy don't go together. And that's my responsibility as a US citizen is to fight that empire and, and try and change it. And the military has budget and they're doing a lot of green stuff. So I'm working with the ROTC in the high school, admission high school, to say, look, let me teach the kids Instead of this left face, right face bullshit, let me teach them about the green stuff that's going on in the military, because that green stuff is the future. That's the future economy. You know, no matter what we do, Mother Nature is going to enforce that. So, and that's going to get enforced on these ISIS guys too. Syria has no water. There were four years of drought that led to the rebellion where farmers came into the city to protest and they got shot by the government. And that's what started all this shit in Syria. So, Mother Nature. She's the, she's the boss. She bats last, you know, always. So thanks, folks. Really appreciate your attendance.